Book Five, Sections One through Four of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Sections One through Four. One. The design which we propose to ourselves is now nearly completed. Next in order follow the causes of revolution in states, how many and of what nature they are, what modes of destruction apply to particular states, and out of what, and into what they mostly change. Also, what are the modes of preservation in states generally, or in a particular state, and by what means each state may be best preserved. These questions remain to be considered. In the first place, we must assume as our starting point that in the many forms of government which have sprung up, there has always been an acknowledgment of justice and proportionate equality, although mankind fail attaining them, as I have already explained. Democracy, for example, arises out of the notion that those who are equal in any respect are equal in all respects. Because men are equally free, they claim to be absolutely equal. Oligarchy is based on the notion that those who are unequal in one respect are in all respects unequal. Being unequal, that is, in property, they suppose themselves to be unequal absolutely. The Democrats think that as they are equal, they ought to be equal in all things, while the oligarchs, under the idea that they are unequal, claim too much, which is one form of inequality. All these forms of government have a kind of justice, but, tried by an absolute standard, they are faulty, and therefore both parties, whenever their share in the government does not accord with their preconceived ideas, stir up revolution. Those who excel in virtue have the best right of all to rebel, for they alone can with reason be deemed absolutely unequal, but then they are of all men the least inclined to do so. There is also a superiority which is claimed by men of rank, for they are thought noble because they spring from wealthy and virtuous ancestors. Here then, so to speak, are opened the very springs and fountains of revolution, and hence arise two sorts of changes in governments, the one affecting the constitution, when men seek to change from an existing form into some other, for example from democracy into oligarchy, and from oligarchy into democracy, or from either of them into constitutional government or aristocracy, and conversely, the other not affecting the constitution, when, without disturbing the form of government, whether oligarchy or monarchy or any other, they try to get the administration into their own hands. Further, there is a question of degree. An oligarchy, for example, may become more or less oligarchical, and a democracy more or less democratical and in like manner the characteristics of the other forms of government may be more or less strictly maintained. Or the revolution may be directed against a portion of the constitution only. For example, the establishment or overthrow of a particular office. As at Sparta it is said that Lysander attempted to overthrow the monarchy, and King Posenius the Ephiralty. At Epidamnus, too, the change was partial. For instead of phylarchs or heads of tribes, a council was appointed. But to this day the magistrates are the only members of the ruling class who are compelled to go to the Helii'a when an election takes place. And the office of the single archon was another oligarchical feature. Everywhere inequality is a cause of revolution, but an inequality in which there is no proportion. For instance, a perpetual monarchy among equals, and always it is the desire of equality which rises in rebellion. Now, equality is of two kinds, numerical and proportional. By the first, I mean sameness or equality in number or size. By the second, equality of ratios. For example, the excess of 3 over 2 is numerically equal to the excess of 2 over 1, whereas 4 exceeds 2 in the same ratio in which 2 exceeds 1. For two is the same part of four that one is of two, namely the half. As I was saying before, men agree that justice in the abstract is proportion, but they differ in that some think that if they are equal in any respect, they are equal absolutely. 
others that if they are unequal in any respect, they should be unequal in all. Hence there are two principal forms of government, democracy and oligarchy, for good birth and virtue are rare, but wealth and numbers are more common. In what city shall we find a hundred persons of good birth and of virtue, whereas the rich everywhere abound? That a state should be ordered, simply and wholly, according to either kind of equality, is not a good thing. The proof is the fact that such forms of government never last. They are originally based on a mistake, and, as they begin badly, cannot fail to end badly. The inference is that both kinds of equality should be employed, numerical in some cases, and proportionate in others. Still, democracy appears to be safer and less liable to revolution than oligarchy. For in oligarchies there is the double danger of the oligarchs falling out among themselves and also with the people. But in democracies there is only the danger of a quarrel with the oligarchs. No dissension worth mentioning arises among the people themselves. And we may further remark that a government which is composed of the middle class more nearly approximates to democracy than to oligarchy, and is the safest of the imperfect forms of government. Section 2 in considering how dissensions and political revolutions arise, we must, first of all, ascertain the beginnings and causes of them which affect constitutions generally. They may said to be three in number, and we have now to give an outline of each. We want to know, one, what is the feeling, two, what are the motives of those who make them, three, whence arise political disturbances and quarrels. The universal and chief cause of this revolutionary feeling has already been mentioned, viz. the desire of equality, when men think that they are equal to others who have more than themselves, or, again, the desire of inequality and superiority, when, conceiving themselves to be superior, they think that they have not more, but the same or less than their inferiors, pretensions which may and may not be just. Inferiors revolt in order that they may be equal, and equals that they may be superior. Such is the state of mind which creates revolutions. The motives for making them are the desire of gain and honor, or the fear of dishonor and loss. The authors of them want to divert punishment or dishonor from themselves or their friends. The causes and reasons of revolutions, whereby men are themselves affected in the way described, and about the things which I have mentioned, viewed in one way may be regarded as seven, and in another as more than seven. Two of them have already been noticed, but they act in a different manner, for men are excited against one another by the love of gain and honor, not, as in the case which I have just supposed, in order to obtain them for themselves, but at seeing others, justly or unjustly, engrossing them. Other causes are insolence, fear, excessive predominance, contempt, disproportionate increase in some part of the state. Causes of another sort are election intrigues, carelessness, neglect about trifles, dissimilarity of aliments. Section 3. What share insolence and avarice have in creating revolutions, and how they work, is plain enough. When the magistrates are insolent and grasping, they conspire against one another, and also against the constitution from which they derive their power, making their gains either at the expense of individuals or of the public. It is evident, again, what an influence honor exerts, and how it is a cause of revolution. Men who are themselves dishonored, and who see others obtaining honors, rise in rebellion. The honor or dishonor when undeserved is unjust, and just when awarded according to merit. Again, superiority is a cause of revolution, when one or more persons have a power which is too much for the state and the power of the government. This is a condition of affairs out of which there arises a monarchy, or a family oligarchy. And therefore, in some places, as at Athens and Argos, they have recourse to ostracism. But how much better to provide from the first, that there should be no such preeminent individuals, instead of letting them come into existence, and then finding a remedy? Another cause of revolution is fear. Either men have committed wrong, and are afraid of punishment, or they are expecting to suffer wrong, and are desirous of anticipating their enemy. Thus at Rhodes the notables conspired against the people, through fear of the suits that were brought against them. Contempt is also a cause of insurrection and revolution, for example in oligarchies, 
when those who have no share in the state are the majority, they revolt, because they think that they are the stronger. Or again, in democracies, the rich despise the disorder and anarchy of the state. At Thebes, for example, where, after the Battle of Enophida, the bad administration of the democracy led to its ruin. At Megara, the fall of the democracy was due to a defeat, occasioned by disorder and anarchy. And at Syracuse, the democracy aroused contempt before the tyranny of Gelo arose, at Rhodes before the insurrection. Political revolutions also spring from a disproportionate increase in any part of the state. For, as a body is made up of many members, and every member ought to grow in proportion, that symmetry may be preserved, but loses its nature if the foot be four cubits long, and the rest of the body two spans. And, should the abnormal increase be one of quality as well as of quantity, may even take the form of another animal. Even so, a state has many parts, of which some one may often grow imperceptibly. For example, the number of poor in democracies and in constitutional states. And this disproportion may sometimes happen by an accident, as at Tarentum, from a defeat in which many of the notables were slain in a battle with the Eopigians, just after the Persian War, the constitutional government in consequence becoming a democracy. Or, as was the case at Argos, where the Argives, after their army had been cut to pieces on the seventh day of the month by Cleomenes, the Lacedaemonian, were compelled to admit to citizen some of their per Isai, and at Athens, when, after frequent debates of their infantry, at the time of the Peloponnesian War, the notables were reduced in number, because the soldiers had to be taken from the role of citizens. Revolutions arise from this cause as well, in democracies as in other forms of government, but not to so great an extent. When the rich grow numerous, or properties increase, the form of government changes into an oligarchy, or a government of families. Forms of government also change, sometimes even without revolution, owing to election contests, as at Horea, where instead of electing their magistrates, they took them by lot, because the electors were in the habit of choosing their own partisans. Or owing to carelessness, when disloyal persons are allowed to find their way into the highest offices, as at Oreum, where upon the accession of Heracleodorus to office, the oligarchy was overthrown, and changed by him into a constitutional and democratical government. Again, the revolution may be facilitated by the slightness of the change. I mean that a great change may sometimes slip into the constitution through neglect of a small matter. At Embracia, for instance, the qualification for office, small at first, was eventually reduced to nothing. For the Embraciots thought that a small qualification was much the same as none at all. Another cause of revolution is difference of races, which do not at once acquire a common spirit. For a state is not the growth of a day, any more than it grows out of a multitude brought together by accident. Hence the reception of strangers and colonies, either at the time of their foundation or afterwards, has generally produced revolution. For example, the Achaeans who joined the Trezenians in the foundation of Sybaris, becoming later the more numerous, expelled them. Hence the curse fell upon Sybaris. At Thurii, the Sybarites quarreled with their fellow colonists, thinking that the land belonged to them. They wanted too much of it and were driven out. At Byzantium, the new colonists were detected in a conspiracy, and were expelled by force of arms. The people of Antissa, who had received the Chian exiles, fought with them and drove them out. And the Zancleans, after having received the Samians, were driven by them out of their own city. The citizens of Apollonia on the Euxine, after the introduction of a fresh body of colonists, had a revolution. The Syracusans, after the expulsion of their tyrants, having admitted strangers and mercenaries to the rights of citizenship, quarreled and came to blows. The people of Amphipolis, having received Chalcidian colonists, were nearly all expelled by them. Now in oligarchies, the masses make revolution under the idea that they are unjustly treated, because, as I said before, they are equals, and have not an equal share. And in democracies, the notables revolt, because they are not equals, and yet have only an equal share. Again, the situation of cities is a cause of revolution, when the country is not naturally adapted to preserve the unity of the state. For example, the Chitians at Clazamene did not agree with the people of the island, and the people of Colophon quarreled with the Notians. At Athens, too, the inhabitants of the Piraeus are more democratic than those who live in the city. 
for just as in war the impediment of a ditch, though ever so small, may break a regiment, so every cause of difference, however slight, makes a breach in a city. The greatest opposition is confessedly that of virtue and vice, next comes that of wealth and poverty, and there are other antagonistic elements, greater or less, of which one is the difference of place. Section 4 in revolutions the occasions may be trifling, but great interests are at stake. Even trifles are most important when they concern the rulers, as was the case of old at Syracuse, for the Syracusan constitution was once changed by a love quarrel of two young men who were in the government. The story is that while one of them was away from home, his beloved was gained over by his companion, and he to revenge himself seduced the other's wife. They then drew the ruling class into their quarrel, and so split all the people into portions. We learn from this story that we should be on our guard against the beginnings of such evils, and should put an end to the quarrels of chiefs and mighty men. The mistake lies in the beginning, as the proverb says, well begun is half done. So an error at the beginning, though quite small, bears the same ratio to the errors in the other parts. In general, when the notables quarrel, the whole city is involved, as happened in Hesdia after the Persian War. The occasion was the division of an inheritance. One of two brothers refused to give an account of their father's property and the treasure which he had found. So the poorer of the two quarreled with him and enlisted in his cause the popular party, the other, who was very rich, the wealthy classes. At Delphi, again, a quarrel about a marriage was the beginning of all the troubles which followed. In this case the bridegroom, fancying some occurrence to be of evil omen, came to the bride and went away without taking her. Whereupon her relations, thinking that they were insulted by him, put some of the sacred treasure among his offerings while he was sacrificing, and then slew him, pretending that he had been robbing the temple. At Mytilene, too, a dispute about heiresses was the beginning of many misfortunes, and led to the war with the Athenians in which Pachys took their city. A wealthy citizen named Timophanes left two daughters. Dexander, another citizen, wanted to obtain them for his sons, but he was rejected in a suit, whereupon he stirred up a revolution, and instigated the Athenians, of whom he was Proxenus, to interfere. A similar quarrel about an heiress arose at Phocis, between Nasius, the father of Nason, and Euthycrates, the father of Onomarchus. This was the beginning of the sacred war. A marriage quarrel was also the cause of a change in the government of Epidamnus. A certain man betrothed his daughter to a person whose father, having been made a magistrate, fined the father of the girl, and the latter, stung by the insult, conspired with unenfranchised classes to overthrow the state. Governments also change into oligarchy or into democracy, or into a constitutional government, because the magistrates, or some other section of the state, increase in power or renown. Thus at Athens the reputation gained by the court of the Areopagus in the Persian War seemed to tighten the reins of government. On the other hand, the victory of Salamis, which was gained by the common people who served in the fleet, and won for the Athenians the empire due to the command of the sea, strengthened the democracy. At Argos, the notables, having distinguished themselves against the Lacedaemonians in the Battle of Mantinea, attempted to put down the democracy. At Syracuse, the people, having been the chief authors of the victory in the war with the Athenians, changed the constitutional government into democracy. At Chalcis, the people, uniting with the notables, killed Phoxus the tyrant, and then seized the government. At Ambracia, the people, in like manner, having joined with the conspirators in expelling the tyrant Periander, transferred the government to themselves. And generally it should be remembered that those who have secured power to the state, whether private citizens or magistrates or tribes or any other part or section of the state, are apt to cause revolutions. For either envy of their greatness draws others into rebellion, or they themselves, in their pride of superiority, are unwilling to remain on a level with others. Revolutions also break out when opposite parties, for example the rich and the people, are equally balanced and there is little or no middle class. For if either party were manifestly superior, the other would not risk an attack upon them. And, for this reason, those who are eminent in virtue usually do not stir up insurrections, always being a minority. 
such are the beginnings and causes of the disturbances and revolutions to which every form of government is liable. Revolutions are effected in two ways, by force and by fraud. Force may be applied either at the time of making the revolution or afterwards. Fraud, again, is of two kinds. For one, sometimes the citizens are deceived into acquiescing in a change of government, and afterwards they are held in subjection against their will. This was what happened in the case of the four hundred, who deceived the people by telling them that the king would provide money for the war against the Lacedaemonians, and, having cheated the people, still endeavored to retain the government. 2. In other cases, the people are persuaded at first, and afterwards, by a repetition of the persuasion, their goodwill and allegiance are retained. The revolutions which affect constitutions generally spring from the above-mentioned causes. End of Book 5, Sections 1 through 4